As a religious studies scholar, I get to travel all over the world to study the things I get to study. I get to go to India to see temples, monasteries in Greece, aboriginal villages in Australia, Incan ruins in Peru, and all sorts of places in between. These are sacred places, and they stand out as different from non-sacred places. They're the type of places that make you feel a certain kind of energy, the type of places that might make you contemplate bigger things, the, the type of places where you're more naturally whispering than shouting. California is full of sacred places like this, the majestic natural lands of the Big Sur Coast or the Yosemite Valley are sacred to many people in our state, as well as many places that are human constructed, where they try to take a spiritual legacy and, and put it in stone or brick. One such place is, is a surprise, at least to me originally, and it's in the hills above Bakersfield uh, in a little hamlet called La Paz. It is the final resting place of Cesar Chavez, the labor leader who changed the lives of so many farm workers through the union he founded, the UFW, the United Farm Workers. Now, La Paz is more than just a grave site. It's also a museum, a conference center, a headquarters to the National Chavez Center, and to some, a pilgrimage site. In October of 2012, President Barack Obama left the campaign trail to visit La Paz and to proclaim it America's 498th national monument. And in a moving tribute, President Obama told briefly the life of Chavez, from his beginnings as the son of a migrant, worker, of a migrant farm worker, his time in the Navy, his experience picking in the fields, and his rise as a, sh as a social activist, fighting for the rights of his fellow farm workers through boycotts, marches, and protests. If you grew up in California, you probably know some of this story, because it's part of the curriculum that, uh, that surrounds the state holiday commemorating Chavez's birthday on March 31st. There's even been a movie made about it. However, there's a side to Chavez's story that is more often left out, and that is he was a deeply religious man. And more importantly, when you read Chavez's own words that he provided to interviews and books, he reveals that it was not a, a, a secular ideology that uh, inspired his social activism, but a deep-seated faith in God. Yet when people write or speak about Chavez, they tend to ignore his faith or mention it rather obliquely, like President Obama said, he's a small man with great faith. But I argue to separate Chavez from his faith is like presenting Moses, the father of the Jews, as just a community organizer. One of our jobs as scholars of religion is to remind our fellow Americans that some of our greatest heroes were motivated by their faith. We want, we want to explore how faith motivates actions in surprising ways. So I'm going to retell the story of Chavez, concentrating on his religious life, and then we'll see a few implications of telling the story in this way. Now, some will claim that this is a kind of hagiography. Hagiography is an idealized account of a holy figure, very common in Catholic and Hindu circles. But my purpose here is not to uplift Chavez as a saint, but rather to balance the public record a bit, to remind, uh, to remind you that behind Chavez's tremendous action was a simple but profound faith. So let's begin with the first stirrings of his social activism. It occurred while Chavez was living with his wife in a shack in a barrio uh, appropriately named Sal Si Puede, get out if you can. It's near San Jose. The year is 1952, and Chavez was working as a, as a lumber handler at a mill when he had a chance encounter with a Catholic priest named Father McDonnell that would change his life forever. Father McDonnell taught him a new way of looking at the world. He told him that the harsh conditions in which he lived, in which the farm workers lived, were contrary to the vision that God had for the world, that God cared about all people, but especially the poor and the oppressed. He gave Chavez the writings of Pope Leo XIII, who argued that workers have a rights given to them by God, and reminded him of the patron saint of the poor, St. Francis of Assisi. This vision ultimately drew Chavez back to the church, 
and began a journey where his faith and his activism would be intricately woven together. As he said later in his life, everything the church had taught for 2,000 years is at stake in our struggle. As scholars, we can connect the teachings uh, of Father McDonald to a broader trend that was happening around that time throughout the world, but especially in Latin America. In retrospect, the priest taught something that we would call liberation theology, which has lots of notion, lots of elements to it, but the central notion is that the church needs to be a vehicle to change, uh, a vehicle for social change for the poor and the needy. The faithful Christian was the one that actively worked for the plight of the children of God that society seemed to forget. Hearing this message was a turning point for Chavez's life. And from that point forward, he began to dedicate his life to the poor that surrounded him, the farm workers of California. Chavez, Chavez began to organize the farm workers and eventually founded the union that will become the UFW. And here, the story reads more like one of an ancient prophet than a modern secularist activist. Now the term prophet is misunderstood by many circles because it's usually associated with people who predict the future. But this narrow definition is not the only one we use in religious studies. The word prophet comes from the ancient Greek language and in the ancient Greek language, prophet means to speak for another, usually God. The most famous prophets are the Jewish prophets uh, of the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament, and Islam's Quran, who spoke on behalf of God to inspire change in their society. Their stories are some of the most fun reading in the Bible, and they tend to follow a pattern. Their period of prophecy begins with a moment when it becomes clear that God is asking them to sacrifice their own will to a cause bigger than themselves. This point came for Chavez, and we can point to it uh, specifically. It was right before he was about to ask the people to strike for the first time. He was going to speak in front of a large audience in a hall dedicated to the Virgin of Guadalupe. And as he stood there, he was beside another priest that was helping him on the movement, and he heard the crowd cry out, Viva Cesar Chavez, on live Cesar Chavez. He turned to the priest and said, I don't want to be that man. I don't want to be indispensable. I want to be able to leave and know that the union will go on. The priest responded by saying, you have told the members that they will have to sacrifice greatly. Maybe that's what you're called on to do now. Sacrifice your privacy. Do things you feel very uncomfortable doing for the good of the group. Maybe in a couple of years you can step out of the spotlight, but right now this is just something you have to accept. It's a cross you have to bear. Hesitant but emboldened, Chavez stepped to the podium and announced the following better word. He said, I quote, 150 years ago in the state of Guanajuato in Mexico, a padre proclaimed the struggle for liberty. He was killed, but 10 years later, Mexico won its independence. We are engaged in another struggle for the freedom and dignity what poverty denies us, but it is not to be a violent struggle, even if violence is used against us. Chavez here becomes a new padre calling for a new revolution, but also guided by faith. By consciously and directly connection, connecting himself with the famous Mexican priest, Chavez sets himself up as a prophet, proclaiming a new kingdom, a promised land based on God. And after these few words, a simple field worker, her face lit with emotions, the, the reports say, handed, him a, handed Chavez a statue of Jesus Christ in green and white robes. Chavez slowly raised it over his head and the crowd shouted, Viva! Viva la huelga, viva the strike. Viva la casa, viva Cesar Chavez. And he had become a prophet in their eyes. The first, that first strike continued without hopes of a settlement. And Chavez decided that the farm workers would march from where they were in Delano to Sacramento in the spring of 1966. When he saw that, when he presented that march, he presented it not in political terms, but he presented it in religious ones. He announced the theme of that march would be penitence, pilgrimage, and revolution. He deliberately created a religious aura. In front of them was always the Virgin of Guadalupe. Mass was said at every, in every morning. At night, hymns were sung, prayers were said. 
the, one of the reporters that was on the trip said, it's a Passover march to the promised land because it happened during Lent. And that long journey culminated on, on Easter. And when he arrived, Chavez, intense pain from the grueling walk, but refusing to take any, any medicine or any painkillers at all because he saw it as penitence. When he arrived, 10,000 people were waiting for him to celebrate the miracle of resurrection. But the miracle they celebrated there was the day of Easter they signed the very first contract with the grape growers. And the result of that Easter pilgrimage was a victory over the instrument of the culture of death. It was a sort of resurrection, he said.